Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is happening, everybody? Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in the studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. His name is Padawan J. Well, let me talk to you. Yeah. And Ken, boy, why, are, why are you kneeling down on one knee right now? Why am I doing that, Pad? Uh, I heard you're taking a knee at the one-yard line. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough, sir. We'll be talking about that and a whole lot more. This is a fusion edition of the ODPH, kicking off the new year as only we can. And Pad, obviously want everybody talking with us throughout the year. Where should they go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Swing it over to the website. Check out the T Public Store link. Check out the Patreon link. One tier, $2 a month. Check out the social media accounts. Everything's updated. Got some videos up there from the YouTube channels, especially the Cheersy Awards on Nerd Initiative, Mm -hmm. which everybody is talking about in the land of comics right now. No lie, folks. The turnout has been incredible on all the platforms. The publishers have been chiming in with some praises, obviously. Uh, if you want to find out what happened on the show, you got to just tune into Nerd Initiative YouTube, and you can definitely check that all that out. The blog section is on the website, though. New reviews are up right now. Got a couple more things in the works. The classified section, which is friends of the show, such as 3FN Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, which has a big 2024 on hand, so you definitely mm-hmm. want to check that out. The directory pad, how many providers are we on? Oh, 135,000. Sounds about right to me. That is why Pat Awanjay is the statistician to the stars. The music section where you can find out friends of the show such as Brian Wolf and the Howlers, Second Suitor, Tom Jolu, Floodlands, Shout at the Robots, and many, many more. Basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media, if you're using hashtags, use the hashtag ODPHpod. Kicking off the first edition of the show for 2024, it is still the NFL season. It is winding down. But we still have to talk about the games that were, so let's get into the locks and leaps, shall we, Pad? Yeah, so we're going to start with one. Uh, we actually both had the same locks this week, so we'll be talking about both of those. But we're, the first one we're going to start with, I think, is the one that shocked everybody in the NFL. Oh, my God. And the sporting world. Uh, because uh, when I saw this score, I went, wait, what happened? Uh, and that was, I picked the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Arizona Cardinals. Because, hey, listen, the Arizona Cardinals are fucking awful. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at tankathon.com slash NFL, which gives you the most up-to-date uh, placements of the NFL teams and where they would stack up if the uh, NFL draft were to, were to occur at that exact moment. Right now, the Arizona Cardinals have the number four overall pick, so they're pretty bad. So I went and looked at that and went, hey, yeah, I figure Arizona, or not Arizona, uh, Philly can pull this off. And, hmm, well, apparently they didn't understand the assignment because the Arizona Cardinals beat the Philadelphia Eagles 35-31. to Kyler Murray, 25 of 31 for 232 yards passing, three touchdowns, just one interception. Jalen Hurts, 18 of 23 for 167 yards passing, three touchdowns, one interception. DeAndre Swift led the way for Philly in rushing with 13 carries, 61 yards, no touchdowns. James Conner led the way for Arizona in rushing with 26 carries, 128 yards rushing. Sheesh. Uh, one touchdown. And then on receiving, it was Greg Dorch, uh, D O. O-R-T-C-H, with uh, seven catches, 82 yards, and no touchdowns for Arizona, with A.J. Brown uh, leading the way for Philly. Four catches, 53 yards, and no touchdowns. Philly took their eye off the prize. Yes, they did. That's the easiest way to describe this. They have not locked up the second seed, have they? No, I don't believe so. Let me pull up. I've got the standings here. Because while you're checking into that, this is how big this game was, and this should have been an easy win for Philly. But they blew it. Uh, they So they are currently in the number two position overall. They have a playoff berth, but they have not clinched the division. Right. So now next week's game is a must win. Uh-huh. And especially most of the games next week are interdivision. 
No, they all are. Oh, they all are. Okay. I'm, I, that's I'm almost certain they all are. I can double check that. I was pretty sure. I couldn't remember if one was Switch or not. But regardless of that fact, this is how crucial this game was. And for Philly to be spiraling, and I think that's the easiest way I can describe that right now. Uh, ever since you and a number of other folks, and I'm not throwing shade at you, but just ever since you and a number of folks number uh, a few weeks ago said, we're going to get Kelsey Bull too, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Mm, just want to say they started slipping and sliding. Yeah, I think that it's a weird statement to make, but I'm going to make it anyway. I think Philly started buying into their own hype. That could be. Which is very unlike what this team has shown throughout the year. Uh, all of the games are division. Okay. I, I, I had a feeling they were, obviously, yeah. the last week of the season. They always make it very, very interesting with that. But now for Philly, they're going to go up against a Giants team that has nothing to lose, and this should mm-hmm. be another easy win. Mm-hmm. But you see about the Cardinals, I mean, and let's face it, Pat, you, were, you hit it right on the head. They're garbage. Yeah, they are. They're not good. They're- I figured, you know, they started off garbage, and they've been pretty garbage all year, but I figured they'd win a couple of games just because Kyler Murray's not the kind of guy that just, like, rolls over and lets somebody steamroll him for an entire season because the team sucks. Mm-hmm. You know, I know at one point they had the number two overall pick, and and possibly that they were they, you know they were in contention for the number one, you know obviously before Carolina stunk up the joint. Yeah. But I, I I sat there and I thought to myself a couple of weeks ago I'm like listen we know with and this was around the time Kyler Murray was coming back I know I said to you and a couple other folks listen we know Arizona is going to rattle off a couple of wins here because Kyler Murray is just that guy right. But the fact that they were up twenty one to six at halftime uh-huh. and they let Arizona outscore them in the second half. 29 to 10. Hey, so, that's what you call not ideal. Although, I just want to point out one thing. Uh, the Eagles did make a defensive coordinator switch here at late in the season. Hmm. That is uh, one Matt Patricia is now calling the defense for Philly there. So, just want to point that out. Interesting. For what it's worth. Well, I think you have to. With the slide going on, and Philly is a Super Bowl contender. Like, let's be honest about no, this. No, they are. 11 and 5. Yeah. You, and the way they were playing earlier this season, up until the slide, yes. No, they, they are contenders. And just to see this team lose focus, because that's what it is. I'm uh-huh. sorry. No, it is. The fact that you're up that big, you need to close out on a team like Arizona, who, let's mm-hmm. face it, half the names you were reading off on the stat line, Pat, I have no idea who they are. I mean, obviously, everyone's heard of Kyler Murray. Sure. And James Conner, at least to some degree. That's it. But, like, you look at the rest of the names for receive. You know, I'll run through the running backs as well. Excuse me. Uh, you Michael Carter, never heard of him. Kyler Murray, obviously, okay, I heard of him. Rondell Moore, I've heard of him. You know, not a ton, but at least I recognize the name. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned for the receivers, I mentioned Greg Dorched. Uh, you got Trey McBride, who for some reason rings a bell, although that could be just like it's closely uh, sounds like another name. Sure. Michael Wilson, nope. Rondell Moore, mentioned him. Elijah Higgins, nope. Uh, Amari DeMarcado, nope. Uh, Michael Carter, nope. And James Conner, okay, I've heard of him. Yeah. So it, it's like the Kyler Murray and James Conner show, and then, well, yeah. Exactly. That's why this team is doing so bad at the, throughout the year. And, and that's also, you got to figure, factor in Kyler Murray didn't play the full year. Right. So Arizona came to Philly and punched them right in the mouth. West Coast team coming east my ass. Yeah, like this is just mind-blowing to see. And for Hurts, not the greatest game, even though 167 in the air. That's yeah. that's not a great game for him. Three touchdowns is a normal game for Three him. Three touchdowns is like, you know, he wakes up in the morning. Yeah. But for everything else, it's just this Philly team is falling apart at the worst time. Mm-hmm. And if they have not clinched that division, <laughs> which they haven't, which at this stage, they're, I'm not feeling so fully confident in them going against the Giants next week. They should. Right. They should win outright. But I feel that you're going to have an upset somewhere, and I think that Dallas is playing better right. at this stage than Philly is, and especially if Philly thinks they're just going to coast in against the Giants. I mean, we I know we, we pick on the Giants quite often. Oh, uh, we do. The Giants have nothing to lose but play spoiler. So the Giants game, as you alluded to, is their final game of the regular season. It is at 425 Eastern in MetLife Stadium. So I know what game will be on locally in our area. Mm -hmm. Uh, Understandably so, too. Uh, Currently, the line is Philly by five. uh, And the over-under is 41 and a half. And honestly, the way these teams have been playing, uh, take the under. 
Um, but no, and, and then looking at the playoff standings, and thank you, NFL on Fox, for this wonderful little graphic y'all put together uh, with the uh, playoff bracket. So right now as we record, obviously with the Dallas Cowboys being the number two, uh, that makes the Eagles the number five. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys would technically be facing the Green Bay Packers in the first round in the NFL playoffs. And the Philadelphia Eagles would be playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the first round of the playoffs. Now, the Eagles, in theory, should be, you know, Tampa Bay, but the way they've been playing, I wouldn't put it past Tampa Bay to beat them. You know, and then you flip on the other side, if they were to somehow, you know, win the division and Dallas doesn't get the division and you, and you flop, if everything else stays the same and you flop the two, mm-hmm. there's a real shot Green Bay, I think, could beat Philly because Philly is just not that good. And and honestly, Green Bay's kind of comparable to them in a way, the way they've been playing. I'm not saying on paper Green Bay's better right, than, right, on, right. than Philly, but just the way they've been playing, they're pretty comparable. It's very equal. And that's the scary thing. I think Green Bay could make a lot of noise, and I think they could upset Philly. Tampa Bay is one of those bubble teams. Like We did not think they were going to be as good as they are. No. But Baker is playing at such a high level, he'll keep them in that game. And if, right. it, and if it comes down to a situation where Philly's up, I mean, look at what Arizona did. Yeah. And they're not the caliber of Tampa Bay or nope. Green Bay. So you have to sit there and say this is a very bad loss for Philly. Next week, I, who would have thought we'd say week 18 is a must win. Uh-huh. But it's going to have to be a must win for Philly. Yeah. Same thing with Dallas. Yep. That no team in the NFC East is allowed to slip. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, they might go to the playoffs, but you take a look at the seeding situation. Yeah. They want to get that number two. Mm-hmm. I would not want to be the number five. I'm just putting that out right now. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so we mentioned in the Philly game next week, the Arizona Cardinals, the, the final week of the regular season, are at home against the Seattle Seahawks. That one is at 425 Eastern on Fox. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then we got to talk one of my leaps, and uh, my one of the leaps I chose was the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers to defeat the Seattle Seahawks, which they did by the final score of 30 to 23. Uh, Mason Rudolph going 18 to 24 for 274 yards passing, no touchdowns or interceptions. Geno Smith, 23 of 33, 290 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Kenneth Walker, the third, uh, led the way for Seattle in rushing with 10 carries, 53 yards, one touchdown. Najee Harris led the way for Pittsburgh with Jesus Christ, 27 carries, 122 yards rushing and two touchdowns. Touchdowns definitely helping some fantasy owners there. That it did. Uh, and then you got for Pittsburgh and receiving, it was George Pickens with seven catches, 131 yards receiving, no touchdowns. And on Seattle side, it was DK Metcalf. Have a game. Five catches, 106 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, with this win, securing another uh, season for head Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin with a winning season. Uh, fun fact, in case you didn't know, uh, Mike Tomlin never had a losing season in his tenure in Pittsburgh. It goes to show Tomlin knows what he's doing. On some level, yes. I, in my opinion, I think he's he, he's not getting enough praise for what he does there. Considering the cast of characters, and I think that's the nicest way to put it, Yeah, the cast of characters he's had to deal with over the years. I yeah. mean, you, you, you can run through the list. Oh, yes. Uh, the fact that he's A, still there, B, still has his job in some capacity. Because like, I can see him like in the middle of all that nonsense, like stepping away and taking like a front office job and oh, like, sure. Hey, ter- totally fine. Understandable. You know, you've, you've won a super bowl with this team and you've been to another super bowl with this team. You have cemented your legacy, but like the fact that he's still there, he's still the head coach and they're still admittedly very ugly, you know, cranking out wins and, and winning and contending, you know, they're not exactly super bowl favorites this year. They're not exactly, I wouldn't even say AFC, championship favorites this year but they're still in it they're still above 500 and that's a that's a credit to tomlin well they still have an outside chance of getting playoffs oh sure there's a weird setup that is taking place that they could sneak in but there's a lot of parts involved oh sure because right now they are the nine seed but they have the same record as the houston texans at the eight the indianapolis colts at the seven and oh by the way the buffalo bills are right there at the six with a record of ten and six so we'll get to them later Mm -hmm. so that's the whole thing about this game like they're they're finding ways to win It's, it's not pretty it's not exciting Per se. I mean, you look at that Mason Rudolph stat line, and it's like 274 and no touchdowns or interceptions. But then, hey, give the O-line credit, one sack. You know, that's that's a stat line that I look at and go, 
you know, that might come down to like a field goal or like a safety at the end of the game. If, if you just told, read me the stat line and, and asked me to guess what the outcome was, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say a win by seven points. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't say that either. And that was a bad loss for Seattle, who desperately uh-huh. needed that for their playoffs. Uh huh. It, there's going to be, like I say, moving parts is probably the nicest way to put it. There's there's still a chance for Seattle to make it, but they need a lot of help mm-hmm. because they're currently the eighth seed, but they also have the same record as Green Bay, who is the seven. Right. So depending on how next week goes, I mean, this might be one of the most vital week 18s in recent memory. This is going to be one you're going to need like three TVs, two tablets, a couple phones just to keep track of everything. Well, especially with how the final seedings are going to be taking place, especially Uh the AFC, which is very much up for grabs. Yeah, it is. And nothing is a lock by any chance. Like The fact that Pittsburgh is still technically on paper and involved at this stage. I'll say, I mean, I'm looking at the AFC. The only things that are for sure locked up right now is Baltimore's in, and they have the number one overall seed. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Kansas City Chiefs are in, and they've clinched the division. So that's the one and the three seed, respectively. And then you've got the Cleveland Browns at the five seed who've clinched the wild card berth. Literally everything else, including like, okay, yeah, the Dolphins have clinched a playoff spot, but they haven't clinched the division nor their spot. The AFC South is still up for grabs because, yeah, Jacksonville's got the division lead right now, but, hey, Indianapolis has got the same record as them. So Indianapolis is still in there. And, oh, by the way, Houston's right there with the same goddamn record. Yeah. It's crazy to see how this all plays out, and that's why the division games are going to matter so Those much more. Those script writers need a raise. I'm telling you. It's going to be compelling TV for the final week. Like uh-huh. who, who would have thought, especially for the AFC, which by the time it's all said and done, I mean, there's going to be a lot of upsets, uh huh, big time. And, oh yeah, and you're going to see. Obviously, the games kick off Saturday. Yep, you know, four thirty for the Steelers and Ravens on ESPN and ABC, mm-hmm. and then the Texans and Colts are right after. That is going to decide a couple things going into Sunday night, and mm-hmm. then literally, it's going to come down to the eight o'clock game between the Bills and Dolphins. Yep. And that one has big implications as well, too. There's a reason we sat here for, what, like four months now? Mm -hmm. Before, you know, because like the final week of the season wasn't like generic times, and then they just switched it to TB determined. It's been to be determined on the week 18 games all year. Yeah. And this is why, you know, they wanted to see how things shook out, how things played out. And ultimately, at the end of the day, where the games were going to end up, you know, the garbage, no mean nothing games are going to be early. There will surely be some sprinkled in just for, you know, viewership's sake. But that's why the big marquee ones, you know, that everyone's real interested in are later in the day. Mm, Fully agree. Interesting times we live in for Mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, you mentioned the, uh, uh, what is it, the Pittsburgh game, which is against their Baltimore yep. this upcoming week. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the Seattle Seahawks are on the road this upcoming Sunday uh, against the Arizona Cardinals at 425 Eastern on Fox. Well, we're going to have to see who wants it more. I mean, that's going to uh-huh. be the question. And granted, I think there's only a couple teams that are going to benefit with sitting some starters. Uh, which it is now being reported the Ravens are sitting Lamar for Week 18. As they should. Well, yeah. I mean, I know that you're going to hear some griping about oh, sure. you know, competitiveness. Oh, sure. But let's face it, if you lock up, I it's kind of like almost pick your poison. Mm-hmm. If you're the number one seed, mm-hmm. I would sit every starter. I'd maybe have them play a series and then set them. See, I wouldn't. Like in the case of the team we're going to talk about next, the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. McCaffrey is hurt. Yeah, that's true. And even if he has a mild strain uh, running, I would say you take the week off. We're going to have the bye. You'll have two weeks to be healthy. He's too crucial to the game. Same thing with Lamar Jackson. That's true. Because if you, it, just in case a fluke thing happens, and let's face it, pro sports is a weird thing. Mm-hmm. The word fluke is part of the vocabulary for a reason. If something happened to Lamar Jackson, hypothetically, uh huh, there goes Baltimore season. Uh, they're done. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd sit everybody. The only question is, is Pittsburgh's backups good enough to beat? Or, I'm sorry, is Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh starters, starters good enough to beat Baltimore's backups? I mean, at any given Sunday, divisional matchup, you never know. Yeah. You know, Mason Rudolph has certainly shown flashes of brilliance throughout the year it's, and also flashes of, flashes of uh, I don't want to say 
being shitty, but like not good. Yeah, let's. So it's so it's which Mason Rudolph is going to show up because Najee will Najee will do his best and Pickens will do his best and obviously the Pittsburgh Steelers defense is going to try and do their best. It's it's just which version of Mason Rudolph is going to show up. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see. That's going to be interesting. Oh yeah. But next up, though, we have to talk about those previously mentioned San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. Uh, so they were favorites to beat the Washington Commanders, which, bum, they, bum, 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 bum. which they did by the final score of 27 to 10. Brock Purdy, 22 to 28 for 230 yards passing, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. Sam Howell got the start for Washington with going 17 for 28, 169 yards passing, one touchdown, two interceptions. Brian Robinson Jr. led the way for Washington in rushing with nine carries, 45 four yards no touchdowns elijah mitchell led the way for san francisco in rushing with 17 carries 80 yards one touchdown brandon Ayuk led the way for san francisco in receiving with seven catches 114 yards receiving uh one touchdown and then terry mclaurin led the way for washington with four catches 61 yards and one touchdown not really a, a great game to deep dive into other than the 49ers are looking great. Mm-hmm. McCaffrey, as I talked about, had a mild sprain. He ain't playing the next game. No, he's definitely not. He is out. Yes, he rightfully so. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I'm if i San Francisco, I am not doubting. I'm I'm sitting Purdy. I'm sitting him, uh, McCaffrey. I'm sitting Debo, yeah. Kittle. I'm sitting my main weapons on yeah. offense. Nobody's playing for two weeks. No. Rest up. Come back healthy because whoever they're going to be facing the first round for them is going to be a hell of a matchup. Mm-hmm. Because technically, I mean, you just got to look at the seeding when it's going to be there. Right. But depending on who it is, especially if it's somebody coming out of the five seed. Right. Which right now would be Philly. Yeah. I mean, depending on how all that kind of factors Yeah, because it's the lowest seed that goes on to play the one seed. Yeah. So it all depends on who wins in the wild card weekend. Yeah. So like I say, if you have to, it's hypothetically, if you imagine if it's Philly. Oh, yeah. Yo. Like I say, just however it kind of shapes up like that, that's how unpredictable the playoffs are uh, right now. To quote LL Cool J, Mama said knock you out. Exactly. I'm saying I'm sitting everybody. They finished on a high note. Mm-hmm. For Washington, it's a lot more questions going into the offseason. I was seeing a couple places on social media, and I, granted, this scenario sounds wild to me. Yeah. And I and I apologize. I can't remember the places I saw this. Mm-hmm. Washington, have they talked about trading up for the number one pick? I mean, they're currently sitting with the number two pick. And, and Carolina, by, well, Chicago by way of Carolina has locked up the number one pick. Washington has the number two overall pick right now. Patriots are number three. They have the exact same record, the exact same win percentage, and the exact almost the exact same strength of schedule. The only reason Washington is ahead of New England right now is because Washington's got a win on us this year. Mm. Um, I mean, I wouldn't doubt it, but like, you know, you gotta you're gonna have to swoon Chicago for that. Yeah, like I say, I just I don't I saw that pop up and I'm like, why? I mean, it, like, I I don't understand it personally because it's not that far a jump. Like if 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 Washington were saying like the number eleven or number twelve spot, yeah, then okay, it, okay, okay, I you, I could understand that, but like you're literally number two. I mean, unless they are sold on Caleb Williams being their their franchise quarterback, well, that'd make one person. Well, that's what I say. Like I, which I don't know. I mean, it depends on what they do in the off season with Ron Rivera, right, the head coach. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think he's gone. Probably. I think Eric Bedemy, they would be smart to lock him up. Yeah. Because if not, I guarantee you he's going to wind up being a head coach somewhere next year. There's a reason Sam Howell was leading the NFL in passing yards for a while. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he still is. but Right, but that's the whole thing with Bedemy behind him. I mean, you take a look at the impact he's had with Howell and the regression, so to speak, of Patrick Mahomes. Right. Let's be honest about it. Uh, Sam Howell falling off a little bit. Uh, Tua is now number one passing in the uh, NFL right now. Yeah. It was it was Sam Howell for a long time. Yeah, he was up there for a while, but Tua yeah. came on late. But yeah. but it all goes to show, like, Washington needs a lot of help. Obviously taking on the Cowboys this week. Uh, I think just yeah. it's going to be a showcase of what they have. I, I was kind of hoping the whole NFC East to be locked up. You know, so that way Dallas would sit their starters and then Washington could pull out a win against the Dallas backups because Washington win plus a New England Patriots loss. Listen, as much as it hates me, a New England Patriots loss against the Jets would be very beneficial. Oh, my God. It'd be very beneficial if Washington won and New England lost because that, that'd give us number two. But, you know, at this point, I'll take what I can get. But obviously, that's not playing out. Playing out, uh, the Dallas starters are absolutely going to start next week. <laughs> yeah, I think I think if there's two safe picks next week, it's Dallas and Philly. Probably for that reason, they need to play. Yeah, 
for Washington. It's night. It's been a nice season. I mean, you you got a promising future. It, it it's going to be a rough start. You know, you've got the new ownership. Hopefully, they can get you some new pieces in there, and 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 that the allure of a new new ownership and Dan Snyder being gone, maybe get you a new uh, stadium. Because I th- I think the universal thing everyone will agree with, including Washington Commanders fans, is that stadium sucks. Yes. Um. You know, get you get them a new stadium. You know, get them some new players, and and, and maybe in a couple of years you'll be looking bright and shiny. They're going to need a lot of work, and I think yeah. they're, they're going to be the team that retools the most this offseason. A lot of work. Honesty. A lot of work that needs done. Yeah, even more so than Chicago. I think that Washington, you're going to see a whole new team on that sideline next Probably. year. Probably. Uh, so like you mentioned, the Washington Commanders are playing the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday, January 7th. Uh, that is in Washington, by the way. Uh, that is at 425 p.m. Eastern on Fox. As for the San Francisco 49ers, they are playing on Sunday, January 7th at home against the Los Angeles Rams at 425 Eastern on Fox. Fox. Uh, so I'm going to be mentioned a lot at the same times. Uh, check your local listings for what game is going to be on yes. in your area. Or if you have uh, the NFL uh, ticket, you know, it doesn't matter to you. You can watch whatever. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, probably the game that caused the most controversy this holy week. Holy hell. You know, I had a feeling about Detroit. Uh huh. And Detroit should have won this game. Absolutely. Because they're the grittiest team in all of football. It ain't sexy. But it works. No, it's not. And they were completely screwed out of this one. Yep. Dallas got a very big win. Asterisk. But, but there's an asterisk by it. I know I'm going to hear from some Cowboy fans. But let's talk about it. So, yeah, the Dallas Cowboys defeated the Detroit Lions by the final score of 22-19. Dak Prescott, 26-38 for 345 yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Jared Goff, 19-34 for 271 yards passing, one touchdown, two interceptions. Uh, David Montgomery led the way for Detroit in rushing with 14 carries, 65 yards, and one touchdown. Tony Pollard led the way for Dallas in rushing with 16 carries, 49 yards, and no touchdowns. Uh, C. D. Lamb led the way in receiving for Dallas with 13 catches. Holy fuck. 227 mm-hmm. yards receiving. Uh, apparently, Detroit's secondary forgot how to play. Uh, only one touchdown for da- for uh, Lamb, though. Uh, and then for Detroit, it was who else? Amon Ross, St. Brown, with uh, six catches, 90 yards, and one touchdown. Well, the story of this game is Detroit came back. Yeah. They did not have a great game. I mean, the whole this first half is honestly forgettable because mm. 7 to 3 at halftime. Yikes. Yeah, it was a, it was a bad start. Yikes. But the second half is where everything got interesting and then the last play of the game. Uh-huh. Where Detroit came back and scored a touchdown making it 20 to 19. Mhm. And Dan Campbell, who has Ice water in his veins. Dude has got some stones on him. I tell you what, he's gone for the two-point conversion in a game like this, I believe, four times now. Probably. And you're either the hero or you're the villain Mm -hmm. for doing this. The first time they did this, they scored. Mm -hmm. However, the game has got this big asterisk by it because uh, allegedly the... uh, lineman that came in as a receiver mm-hmm. was not credited or claimed it was not checked in properly. There, There's a whole controversy with the process. So, like, obviously the receivers, you know they're eligible. But then there is, a, on occasion, you know, you will have an offensive lineman uh, go to the ref and say, hey, hey, I'm, I'm eligible this play. And they will announce to the uh, – Everybody to the to the crowd. Usually, it doesn't come through on the TV broadcast, but you can you can occasionally the, this uh, stadium or arena mics will pick it up. Yeah, uh, and they will say you know, you'll hear a you'll hear a you know a voice of God type scenario where you'll just hear number seventy is reporting as eligible. Mm-hmm. You know, and you go oh, okay. So there was there was a kerfuffle with the lineman and the referee in question as to whether or not he actually reported as eligible. Yeah, and that really played a factor because the next play, uh, I believe there was an offside, so even causing more drama. Right, because it started off at the five, and then it got pushed back, and I know they made a, the second two-point conversion attempt from like the seven or so, or something. like. Maybe it was at the two, and they moved, moved it back to the seven. It was something mm-hmm. like that. And then ultimately, the, Jared Goff could not connect in the final play to end the game. Uh-huh. So they wind up losing by one. Yeah. Yeah, because he was trying to get to James Mitchell. Right. So this really was a bad loss, but it you know there, th- this is going to sound weird saying 
it's bad that Detroit lost this one. Right. It truly is. Because, oh, yeah. Because, yeah. It, it takes the wind out of your sail a little bit. Oh, it does. At but, the, like, the least opportune time. But I think what is the bigger message with his, and this will this will sound crazy, but just hear me out. Okay. What have we been knocking on Detroit this entire season? They can't win against competitors. True. The 500. They're the yeah, Miamis of the yeah, NFC. Yeah. This game, they gave Dallas all they could handle. They came back from behind, and they they should have had this game won. Right. They proved that they could hang with a team that has a winning record and is vastly underrated, in yeah. my opinion. Dallas, yeah. Dallas, I'll give the Dallas their due. They're, 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 other than their run game, they're good. Yeah. Their run game isn't anything special this year. Their run, their run game is, uh, is a downgrade. Oh, oh, yeah. Just putting it out there. The fact that Detroit hung in here, came from behind, tied it at least, you have to get the sense that, yeah, this is a little bit of momentum going into the final week of the season because they've clinched their spot. I know it's a crushing loss, too, but it's going to be a question of can they bounce back from this. Mm -hmm. And this is a situation that I think is the bigger issue is mentally Dan Campbell is going to get this team ready to go. This week does not mean anything. I could see them fully sitting starters. Right. This is nothing for them. They're locked in the three spot. But the question mark is going to be the following week, whoever they got to face, they have to come out early. They have to come out hot. Uh Uh-huh. And they can't have a slow start like this. Right. If they do, it's going to prove that this loss is still lurking around them. Right. Because if you take a look at the playoff picture now – they should be able to really hang with the other teams mm-hmm. that are in that setting. Uh, so right now, as we currently record, the Dallas Cowboys, as I mentioned earlier, are the number two seed. They would be facing the number seven seed Green Bay Packers in the wild card weekend. Mm-hmm. And the Detroit Lions are the number three seed who would be facing the sixth seeded L.A. Rams in the first round. And that is a game they could win. Oh, absolutely. I tell you what, take the over. Yeah. Take the over in that yeah. one. Yeah. But that's a game that can completely win. So it just depends on how Detroit comes out with all that emotion. Uh huh. I fully think they'll bounce back from this. I think it's just a shame that a game like this, which really would have skyrocketed that confidence, yeah, came down to a botched call, yeah, by the referees who, you know, for whatever reason, didn't get it right. Yeah, and, I mean, it is what it is. Refs make shitty calls each week. It's unfortunate that it happened. You know, at this point in the season, and I, and I know, you know, people are digging through the referee's history and all the issues he's had, and it's obviously made some repercussions because, as is reported, being reported uh, by uh, one of the local station, WILX in uh, Michigan, uh, where the headline in this article says, NFL reportedly downgrades Brad Allen, that's the ref who was involved in this, uh, ref crew, Brad Allen's ref crew for the playoffs after controversial call against a Detroit on a two-point attempt. Uh, so he is, as is being reported, uh, it was first reported by, by WXYZ in Detroit, uh, you know, and others that, that, uh, Brad Allen and his crew are not officiating the NFL playoffs, you know, this, this, uh, season, <laughs> but Brad Allen's crew does have another kind of big game coming up this week because they are calling the, uh, Raven Steelers game yeah. in week 18. Yikes. Yeah, it's a situation that in that game they they can't afford to have a hiccup. Right. I mean, it, like we said, it's shitty. It happened, and and it's unfortunate. But it's like we say with a lot of other sports, you know, boxing predominantly among them. Don't leave it in the refs' hands. Exactly. I mean, that's the one thing. I I can't feel that bad for Detroit. Uh huh. But they, I mean, it was a it's a tough shame because they did fight hard to come back. And especially in that situation where you had a game that you could definitely have made a, a, a big momentum thing. If they beat Dallas, huge confidence going into this final week. Uh huh. But now it just depends on where their mind frame is after this. Like right. that's the big question mark that we have to sit there and go, okay, is this team for real? Can they bounce back? And I fully think they're going to, but it's also that big question mark. We just don't know. Right. Well, I mean, the big thing with Detroit is, you know, they're they're in the playoffs. Uh, they have got uh, – there it is. Uh, they've clinched the division. Mm-hmm. You know, we know that. So they will be hosting a home game. So I don't care who you put in Ford Field for that wild card weekend. That's going to be – I forget what we said a couple weeks ago. But I know I brought it up a couple weeks ago. That's going to be the first home game since, like, the early 90s. 
uh, in the playoffs for the Detroit Lions. Mm-hmm. That place is going to be rocking. Yeah, you know, come game time. So I don't care what team you put in Ford Field Wild Card Weekend, they're not coming out of there with a win. You know, so it it just sucks that you know. The story isn't, hey, Detroit's in the playoffs. Detroit's looking great. You know, they they might have a real shot at making a, a deep run in the playoffs. It's, hey, look at how they got screwed. Yeah. So we'll just have to see how they bounce back. I think they're going to, but it's yeah. going to be the real test if they can just, you know, look past this game and move forward. Uh, so looking at these two teams' final games of the regular season, as we alluded to earlier, the Dallas Cowboys are on the road playing the Washington Commanders this upcoming Sunday at 425 p.m. Eastern on Fox. And the Detroit Lions are at home this Sunday against the Minnesota Vikings. That'll be at 1 o'clock Eastern on Fox. So that being said, let's take one last lap around the league and before we duck out of the segment. Yeah, so uh, one uh, the uh, Thursday game had the Cleveland Browns beat the New York Jets 37-20. This is going to be made into a movie. Uh, this yeah, is it is. Entire season for yeah. for Cleveland. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, is it a draft day too? Because uh, they'll be the secret. Maybe they should, they should get that with Kevin Costner being the GM. Yeah, still you know what? Yeah, yeah. But no, huge win for the Browns. They're in the playoffs. The most unlikely story of a playoff team this year. Joe Flacco has like middle of the pack. I forget what the exact number is. He's got like middle of the pack higher, you know, uh, touchdown passes. He than uh, some quarterbacks have had all year. It's insane. It's bonkers. Uh, for the Saturday games, uh, we mentioned the Lions and Cowboys already, but then looking at the rest of the Sunday games, uh, the Chicago Bears beat the Atlanta Falcons thirty-seven to seventeen. Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta took a big L. Yeah, they did. Justin Fields might have saved his job. I don't. I don't know. Two sixty-one and one through the air. Uh, Herbert, have yourself a game, why don't you? Uh, Eighteen carries, one hundred and twenty-four yards, one touchdown. Oof. I think the Bears might want to flip that number one pick, maybe. Could be. Just going to put they that out there. They got two in the first fucking ten picks. Right. That's what I said. They can load up with a couple more first-round yeah, picks. They yeah. could, That could do some damage. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts beat the L.A. Raiders by the final score of 23. The L.A. The Las Vegas Raiders. Excuse me. Uh, went back too far. The Las Vegas Raiders by the final score of 23-20. to 20. Huge win for Indianapolis. They needed this one. Uh-huh. Next week is going to be real interesting for them. Oh, yeah. So, But big win for them. Uh, Vegas, I'm just going to put it out there. They need to keep Antonio Pierce as their head coach next Absolutely. year. Next year. Uh, you had the L.A. Rams defeat the New York Giants 26-25. to How the hell did this happen? Uh, reasons. Reasons is the only way to describe this game. Uh, the one rusher for the Rams, Williams, had three touchdowns. That might have helped. Yeah, Kyron Williams had a great game, but... Uh, yeah, just how the heck did the Giants find a way, way to lose this? Cause Listen, they're, it's the Giants. They find a way. I know. I know. It's just it's so weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, the New Orleans Saints beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 23-13. to Tampa Bay's clinched that division, right? Yeah, uh, I do believe. Yeah, Let so they, check. I don't even think they care. I think they just want to get uh, – they, they've locked it. No, they haven't. They haven't? No, they haven't. Fuck, this division sucks. Uh, Tampa Bay's in first place with a record of 8-8. Eight and eight. New Orleans is technically in second place, although they have the same record, 8-8. Eight and eight. Uh, Atlanta Falcons still mathematically fucking involved at 7-9. and nine. Literally the entire division is either at or below 500. This division sucks. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if Tampa Bay loses the division, it's because of this game. Probably. They, they should have put this away easy, but they didn't. Uh, so now things get very interesting. I thought they had this locked up, so I was no, like, this is, no, that's how much both... I pay attention to the, the, that oh, division. Oh, let's <laughs> see the schedule for next week. Who is each team playing? Let's see who I find first. So the Atlanta Falcons are playing, oh, God. The Atlanta Falcons are playing the New Orleans Saints in New Orleans next Sunday. And then for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, where is Carolina. Ter- yeah, they got to be playing Carolina. Yeah, so they are playing Carolina at 1 o'clock. Oh, Jesus Christ. Ugh. One's on CBS, one's on Fox. So if you're a fan of uh, either Atlanta, uh, New Orleans or Tampa Bay, uh, get your remotes ready. Yeah. Ugh. Or have picture in picture. Is that still a thing on TV? Uh, uh, it might be. I don't know. It's on wrestling, so. That's true. Uh, then you had the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, defeat the Carolina Panthers 26 to nothing. I was going to say, if they didn't defeat Carolina, there have been bigger issues to be had here. Trevor Lawrence who? Exactly. Uh they're going to need Beathard to pull out some magic again uh, mm-hmm. moving forward because obviously Jacksonville needs to win to to be kind of relevant for next week. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. So interesting storylines there in Jacksonville. Uh, you had the Baltimore Ravens defeat. Or sorry, they didn't defeat. They put a whooping on the Miami Dolphins, 56 to 19. I absolutely love this game. Holy sh- well, I can understand why. This is my game of the weekend. Oh, my God. So this... P- <laughs> If if you if you wonder why Lamar Jackson is sitting, this is why. Uh-huh. Five mm-hmm. touchdowns. Oh my god. 
Three twenty one in the air. Yeah. On the ground thirty five yards, but it doesn't matter. The fact that they went and just handled business and I like listen, I'll I'll I will take my Miami bias out of this. Okay. Miami struggles against teams over five hundred. Facts. They struggled. And Remember when people were talking about the Miami offense earlier this year when they hung 70 mm-hmm. on Denver as like, oh, this is the greatest team since since the 2001 or whatever it was, uh, St. Louis Rams. Yep. You know, the greatest show on turf. This, this is going to put up record numbers, uh, record number stats and points and yards and yada, yada, yada. They're like, they were comparing it to like even the 07 Patriots. Yeah, about that. Yeah, pump breaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say a chain had a great game running on the ground for one oh seven. Yeah, but, and Tyree, he's, been, he's been consistent all year. Yeah, when he's healthy, he's he's great. But I think the problem that they're having is teams are knowing to slow down their offense. Uh huh. And if they can get a couple stops here and there, and then you can get a good running game going to stop them, it gets too out of rhythm easy. Fucking hell! And and the thing that's piling up for Miami is injuries. Tyree Kill, questionable. Jalen Waddle, questionable. Akane, questionable. Mostair, questionable. David Long Jr., a lot, one of their linebackers, questionable. Javon Hollins, one of their safeties, questionable. Austin Jackson, guard, questionable. Uh, Zach Siller, defensive tackle, questionable. Liam Eichenberg, one of their offensive tackles, questionable. Lester Cotton, guard, questionable. Taron Armstead, offensive tackle, questionable. Those are just fucking today as we record. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you go back to yesterday. Duke Riley, linebacker, questionable. Robert Hunt, offensive tackle, questionable. You go back to New Year's Day. Uh, Jerome Baker is on injured reserve. Uh, Xavier Howard, cornerback, doubtful. Bradley Chubb, linebacker, out. He tore his ACL on Sunday. Yeah. Why? Holy shiza. And, and here's the problem. I'm actually going to call out uh, Mike McDaniel about this one. Okay. Why the hell is he still in there when you have a blowout? Yeah, that I don't get. Like, please explain to me that. He, like, stat padding, maybe? Or, like, maybe helping him hit a bonus? I, don't, I, 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 I Admittedly, I don't know the intimate details of his contract, and, and maybe there's something on Spotrack about, you know, uh, that guy is uh, why he why Baker was still out there. Maybe he was close to getting a, a, a bonus in his contract. I have no idea. No, but that's the whole thing. The, the fact that Trouble was out there it was just foolish. Yeah. And that, I... Like, listen, as a Bills fan, thank you for the gift, I guess. Like, not wishing he got hurt by any means, but that's just foolish, and that's just bad karma on you for keeping him out there. Oh, yeah, that, that's – listen, McDaniels is obviously a good coach. You look at just how Miami has been this year, at least overall, if you if you take it at face value, he's been a good coach, but that's just, you know, the youthful ignorance. He's just – he's so unorthodox, and, that, like, and I don't mean that in a bad sense. Uh-huh. But just some of the ideas he runs with are either they're high risk, high reward. Uh huh. But the fact that I'm sorry, you had your starters out like yeah. In a I mean, blowout. I'm looking at his contract according to Spotrack.com, which this might not give me all of the like bonuses for stats and stuff. Sure. But according to stat, uh, the contract notes thirty three point four two six million guaranteed at signing. That's the signing bonus plus his twenty two salary plus his salary from twenty three. He's got a twenty twenty four salary fully guaranteed uh, on three sixteen twenty three injury guaranteed at signing. Ten million of the twenty twenty five salary is guaranteed for injury only. He's got a $4 million roster bonus on 27, 2024 through 27 per game active bonus of $40,000. If he hits it all, he gets 680,000 annual workout bonus of a hundred thousand dollars. And if he makes the pro bowl, he earns 250,000. So if this lists like stats and like, if you get this many touchdowns, this many, this, this many, that he's literally in there for no reason. Yeah. That's the whole thing that it's mind blowing about this. But like I say, with them having such a crucial game coming up this Sunday, yeah, uh, it's not going to be an easy task because let's face it. Well, we'll talk about it when we get to the Bills. Oh yeah, yeah. But I t- I'll tell you this: early preview of what you know next week. Yeah. But if Miami loses to Buffalo, they're they're one and done in the playoffs. Yeah. There's no way they're making it deep into the playoffs. Even if they beat Buffalo week one, there's you know. The chance, the percent chance they move on in the playoff moves up, but it's not like double digit percentages. I'm not like it, it for me. If they if they make it as the division winners into the playoffs, I'm going to say there's a 65 percent chance. You know, they make it out of the first round of the NFL playoffs. They would be projected to, if they fought, if they don't clinch the number two. They're projected to go face Kansas City, I believe, first round at Arrowhead. Well, then I'm being so. Then if they don't make the playoffs. 
and they got to go face Kansas City at Arrowhead. My 65% then drops to about 35%. I believe that that's how it shapes up. I could be wrong about that. but Well, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at it. If everything stays the same and, and nobody else moves in the AFC, Buffalo and Miami swap. Yeah. So, yeah, B- Buffalo's facing Kansas City right now. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting time, Sunday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. A couple more games from this past Sunday, though. Uh, you had the Houston Texans defeat the Tennessee Titans 26-3. to C.J. Stroud returns strong. Whew. And uh, rookie of the year, calling it now. Easy, easy call. Uh, Bron- Broncos country. That's right. Uh, they beat the LA Chargers by the final score of sixteen to nine. You switch a quarterback and look what happens. Patriots legend Jarrett Stenham. Ignore the fact he threw a pick six in his first career NFL pass. What a messy divorce they're going to have with Russell Wilson. Oh, oh Jesus! What a messy one. Pete Carroll. Oh, I, I cannot I, wait for the tell-all book. Yeah, Pete Carroll's a genius. Yeah, he is. Just putting it out there. Yeah, he is. Speaking about Kansas City, uh huh. They beat the Cincinnati Bengals twenty-five to seventeen. Much needed win, but the only thing that would scare me a little bit facing Harrison Butker when it comes to crunch time. Mm-hmm. Six, six fucking field, field goals. Six field goals. Uh, thank you for my fantasy performance. That definitely helps there. Uh-huh. Uh, and then on the Sunday night game, you had the Green Bay Packers defeat the Minnesota Vikings 33-10. to All they needed was love. Yes, they do. Great game for Jordan Love. And a big win for the Packers, my, or the Minnesota Vikings. Unfortunately, I think their season is a done. Probably. One last game to talk about. And that's because our two teams faced each other this mm-hmm. week. Although this was a bit of a nothing burger. Well, it was admittedly a little. This game, let's be honest, this game was awful for a good portion of it. Oh, yes. Uh, the Buffalo Bills defeated the New England Patriots 27 to 21. Uh, Josh Allen, 15 to 30, 169 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception. Bailey Zapp, 16 to 26, 209 yards passing, no touchdowns, so three interceptions. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott led the way for New England in rushing with 14 carries, 39 yards, one touchdown. James Cook led the way for Buffalo with 16 carries, 48 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, for Buffalo and receiving, it was Dalton Kincaid with four catches, 87 yards, no touchdowns. And for New England, it was Kevin Harris. Two catches, 54 yards, and no touchdowns. Ugly win. This game was fun. Like, I think at one point by halftime, there was like four interceptions total between the two teams. Yeah. This was awful. This is an ugly game. Uh-huh. The only thing is Josh Allen uh, was hurt in this game. He has been cleared as right before we went to air. He is oh. cleared, so he's good to go. Okay. Um. Yeah. That's the only thing really to say about it. Good one yeah. for the Bills. Yeah. Much needed because, obviously, to keep their playoff hopes alive. Sunday night, they have to beat Miami. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, if they lose, they could still make it. But also, Pittsburgh needs to lose, and I believe Jacksonville does too. All we're going to say when it comes to playoff scenarios, pay attention to your broadcast because mm-hmm. if you are watching a game where there's playoff implications, they'll be running that stuff constantly throughout the game. Mm-hmm. And that just means about how big Sunday night got for the Bills. They need to win this one. They typically do not play well down in Miami. Right. Miami uh, is right. yeah. Miami's hurt. That's the only good thing I think they have in their favor. It's going to be a tough matchup, but a one that Buffalo needs to cash in. Uh-huh. So that being said, a lot of storylines going into the final week of the season. So hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. Week 17 is a wrap. How is your team looking going into the final week of the NFL season? Locks and leaps for the podcast has gotten very, very interesting. Uh, yeah. I have to post the bracket online, but uh, next week is going to be a very, very big one. I could see uh, Twitter or X being very, very interesting. Ken potentially could win a championship before the Buffalo Bills. Yes. What a world we live in. I tell you, going back to back, it, it could happen. It, it might happen. That's true. But let's talk about it on the off time. Where we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do you like comic books? What about movies and TV shows? Well, we may be the show for you. We're Hops Geek News, a weekly podcast that discusses comics, movies, and TV shows while featuring a beer of the week. Every week we chat about what we messed up on the week before, and then we dive into what we're reading and watching, as well as some news. We then wrap it up with a geek-themed topic of the week. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts by searching Hops Geek News. Cheers. Cheers. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and the biggest thing going on in entertainment is a return of the MCU to Disney+. Plus. Yes. But not in the traditional sense. No. Arguably their best animated project. Underrated to a certain degree, too. Yes, it is, because to take the concept behind the series and bring it to the pop culture audience, we've Uh always said this a long time on the show, the pop culture audience is very used to the MCU that they know and love. So to take anything and try flipping it a 180 or doing some kind of crazy storytelling right sometimes it hits sometimes it doesn't 
And the one thing about this series is it's very reflective of the long-running comic that has been done by Marvel Comics throughout the years. Uh-huh. And that is what, Pad? Uh, what If. Yes. So for anybody that's not familiar with What If, it is a scenario where a classic story or a classic character has an alternate route to their story, given in either comic book form or even on this animated series, in an animated form. And last season, it made its, or made its debut on Disney+. Plus. Mm-hmm. Rave reviews, as it should, because what it does is it flips certain characteristics that you've seen right. over the years and goes in completely different directions, and it's excellent storytelling. Yeah. And one thing that they did rather well for season one is they kind of tied it into the mainstream MCU. Right. A little bit with a certain st- uh, strange supreme. Right. And how it kind of ran from there, it definitely worked wonders. It was a big hit. So, oh yeah, when we loved heard, it. Yeah, so when we heard the season two was going to be coming out, made sense. It made perfect sense to do. So, what we're going to be doing is recapping the season, giving our thoughts on it. And if you're new to the show, first and foremost, thank you for checking us out. What we like to do is give you a spoiler-free statement on what we're going to be talking about. So, if you haven't seen anything for What If season two yet, we're not going to ruin anything for you. We're just going to give you our quick thoughts on that. Then we give you a countdown. After said countdown, we go deep diving into the series. So you have been considered fair warned. If you need to duck out, Pat puts the liner notes in the episode. Uh Jump back in when you're ready to, and we go from there. So that being said, Pat, give me your spoiler-free statement on Season 2 of Disney Plus's What If? Uh, I enjoyed it. I did not enjoy it as much as I did Season 1. Okay. You know, and it, and it's not for necessarily the overarching story that was told. Although, admittedly, we didn't know it was an overarching story until the final couple episodes. Mm-hmm. But you know, just for what the premise was and some of the stories, some of the individual stories they told in season one, I enjoyed those more than I did season two. I mean, you looking back at some of the f- episodes during season one, you know, what if Captain Carter were the first Avenger? So what if Peggy Carter got the super soldier serum instead of Steve? Mm-hmm. You know, what if T'Challa became Star-Lord? You know, what if Doctor Strange lost his heart instead of his hands? Obviously, there's the wonderful episode, what if zombies? Yeah. You know, what if, what if Killmonger rescued Tony Stark? You know, it's just there were so many episodes in season one that I went, oh, that's an interesting twist. And in some instances, obviously, I think everyone has thought, you know, what if Tony survived, you know, the attack in Iron Man Mm one. But there were just some premise in in, like what if if the if T'Challa was taken from Earth instead of Peter Quill? Yeah, there was just some stuff in season one that I'm like, oh, that's an interesting twist. I never would have thought of that. I enjoyed that. There were a bunch of episodes in season two that I'm just like, why? Why is this a thing? You know, why, why are we doing this? You know, there were certainly some hits and there were certainly some moments and I'm like, you know what? I dug this. I really like this. But for a majority of them, it it just didn't hit for me. No, that's fair. I mean, obviously when the season de- series debuted in 2019, you know, the MCU was pretty 2021 or 2021 rather. Yeah. No, oh, it was announced see, in 2019, 2019. Yeah. Now it's 2019 debuted on August 11th, 2021. Right. And you know, like I say at that point too, the MCU is kind of in this weird state of flux yeah, with yeah. everything going on in the world. Yeah. So to see it come out, I mean, this was a way to recapture the pop culture audience. And, and like I said, the episodes you touched upon for season one really tied into what we had already established with the MCU characters. Mm-hmm. Like I say, coming out right out the gate with Captain Carter, and obviously Agent Carter had a live-action show. Yep. Everybody knows who Peggy Carter is. And then it just kind of dived, in, dived into an overall arcing story. For this season two... It really went some places. And, uh-huh. and for me, being somebody that's read the comic before, uh-huh. whenever they try doing a run, you see a lot of the season two style in that run. Okay. Because they do do major stories. Right. But they also, it depends on who's working on the book, they also take them into some other directions just to explore the creativity. So I was not as fired up about it, so to speak. Not that you were mad about this. But it was one of the situations like I understood what they were trying to do, uh-huh. and I thought this fits into the what if motif from the comics more than the pop culture sure, audience. Sure, so I could understand where you're coming from with it. And I'll be honest, I thought it was very interesting how they started, but I thought once they got around episode six, uh-huh. that's where they started picking up steam. 
Like it was a slow start for me. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I say from episode six to the end is where it finally hit. Like you know, to borrow the term is for, term from Seamus, you know, banger after banger after yes. bang, after banger. I will say, I think the thing that maybe for me hurt with this was the daily release. Yeah, which was nice. Admittedly, I like that. But if you're gonna do that, not the best foot forward. You know, because admittedly, because, you know, and maybe it had something to do with the time of year and, and being busy around the holidays. I admittedly did not wa- start watching these episodes until after Christmas mm-hmm. because I was so busy with life and so busy with everything else. I knew they had come out. I just didn't flat out have time to do it. So it was nice from the aspect of like, you know, I think in one night I, bi- I binge watched like three, four episodes. Mm hmm. But it, it never felt like an, oh, my God, I need to do this. I need to prioritize this type of thing for me. No, I agree with you. I and I mean, granted, a lot of it could have been due to the writer's strike. Yeah. And I think that we, you know, you know, we have to make noted that as much as I hate bringing that up. Yeah, it could be. When the strike was going on, and especially, to you're seeing that little shift in programming schedule. Because uh-huh. as we're going to be talking about next week, Echo comes out all in one day. Oh, yeah, that's right. So the fact that we're not doing episodic yeah. in the sense of weekly. Yeah. I think did hurt this because I understand what they were trying to do. And it's a great idea on paper because kids are home for the holidays, no school. Yeah. It's something new every day. It's something to be excited about. But I think the problem that they had here with it is what if is not your typical s- series? Uh huh. Had it been focused on enter Avenger name here. Right. And they did. Six episodes per day. Sure. Or like every day. Right. I think you would have had a bigger turnout. Okay. And I think you would have had a different reaction. It's tough when you're trying to sell the the B and C characters. Right. To the pop culture audience. Right. But I still think it's a very good series, but I thought like we touched upon once you get to episode six, uh-huh. it really started picking up. It finished very strong, though, for the last episode of the season, though. Well, and I think that's the other thing that maybe turned me up, turned me left a little bit was with season one. Each episode had something to do with one of the movies, and that was that was one of the selling points. Yeah. of season one was that every episode, well, obviously not the zombies episode, but uh, in, uh, irregardless, but like almost every episode had something to do with a movie that had come out. This one. Not really so much. No, definitely not. But there's a lot more to deep dive into it, so let's give you that spoiler-free talk right now. Uh, the countdown is officially on, so we're going to go into spoiler talk in three, two, one. Pad, talk to me. Like I said, the ep- the season was good, you know, but it didn't blow me away, you know. And and honestly, if I go to rewatch them, you know, because obviously season three got announced. I forget when it was, like the same day, mm-hmm. day before, whatever was the final episode. You know, if I go to rewatch the episodes, I'll rewatch all of season one. If I go to rewatch season two, I'm not starting until, you know, episode maybe five or six. Yeah. I'll, I'll skip the first four just because, you know, for me, episode one was okay. You know, we'll, we'll get into some of the other, the, the finer details, you know, but just the first four episodes are honestly forgettable. Well, that's the whole thing about the series. I mean, this is one thing that, in my opinion, they've never been able to do a sustaining run in the comics. Yeah. Because the thing is, for these stories, you have to really entice the audience and give them a scenario like we've always wanted to see. Yeah. It's almost like dream booking in wrestling. Yeah. And what if had done that throughout the years? And every time it's gone in an incarnation and and come back, like they've always started out great, but then it's like, okay, where are we going from here? Right. And I feel, and just this is my opinion, that when we got to season one, yeah, you had the heavy hitters mm-hmm. of the MCU involved. You know, Captain Carter, T'Challa, Doctor Strange. Iron Man. Iron Man. Like, you had the big, you know, the the A-listers. The who's who. Yeah. But when you start out in season two and you go Nebula, Happy Hogan. Right. You know, and Grant Peter Quill... You can say what you want about him. In my opinion, I've always said he's he's not on that level. Like right. he, he's he's a he's a B list character. He, he's known now, but that's big thanks to the movie, right? But I'm saying if, if you see him without the Guardians, right. does it hit as much? Like not really. Like that's the that's the one problem that you have. Yeah. So when they came out like this, I thought, like, okay, it, I appreciate it for being creative. Yeah. But I'm also going like, you're not going to have a lot of buzz about this, right? And that's the problem that I think they had here. However, though, when we start going into season six or episode six, uh-huh. where they introduce a brand new character, yeah, 
And then you're like, okay, let's see where her story leads. This is when it starts picking up. Yeah. And I feel that once we got to the Kahori reshapes reshaped the world, mm-hmm. and we had this amazing introduction to a brand new character. Yeah. And how she came to be later in the season, like I, I think that that was such a huge win. Yeah. That you're, that now you have okay, I can jump in here and get involved and like really kind of get an idea what's going on because her story is a very good one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, we can even do like a quick recap of that. Yeah, no, I mean, so the episode is basically um, set after a surter destroys Asgard during Ragnarok and and the Tesseract crash lands on Earth, you know, and it's in pre-colonial America. And obviously the Tesseract shows up, magical uh, shenanigans ensue, you know, and and numerous tribes folk, uh, go to touch and interact the Tesseract because, hey, it's a bright, shining, glowing object in the middle of a field in pre-colonial America where electricity does not exist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Obviously, people are going to go up and touch it. And obviously, because it's the Tesseract and everything in t- involved with that, they go disappearing. Yeah. And then, obviously, uh, conquistadors in, uh, uh, appear because, hey, you never get around far in pre-colonial America without the conquistadors showing up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so once you start seeing that, you're seeing the first uh, indigenous character. Yeah, uh, start you know f- running from them, and then winds up connecting with the tesseract leftover mm-hmm. that's now in this lake in the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, or this cavern, giving her powers. Uh huh. So it's kind of a great setup that they have here because when you're introducing a new character, that you you have a clean slate. Yeah, and I think that that's something that fans were looking for here because after, like we touched on, she was shot, mm-hmm. falls into the lake. Mm-hmm transports you know to another world yeah gets powers yep. from the transport yep and then is now traveled off to like some in between other dimension for a while yes yeah so it's very cool to see how this it all plays out and then at the end of said episode you see the evil dr strange appear yeah to meet up can't and, show up in in the movie but he can show up here yeah and Cathories, who's voiced by Devery jacobs mm-hmm. you know phenomenal voice acting yeah and really just got you hooked into the character to see what's going on because they gave her a great origin story yeah so now you're invested because once you see strange show up it's like okay that's a big name from the mcu right okay this character is going to mean something later on down the season right that's where they really hit here mm-hmm. because i feel that the other the prior episodes they were great solo stories but they felt one and done, which is much like the comic. I, I'll be honest. The first four episodes, absolute garbage. Like, listen, it's nothing against any of the characters in them. But like, what if Nebula joined the Nova Corps? Didn't care for that one. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, what if Peter Quill attacked Earth's Mightiest Heroes? It was an interesting story, but I didn't care for it. You know, I could I barely remember anything that happened in the damn episode, and I watched it. You know, what if Happy Hogan saved Christmas? Would have been better putting that episode out the next day. Sorry, would have made a lot more sense. You know, couldn't care for that at all. You know, and what if Iron Man crashed into the Grand Master? Okay, the first five minutes were interesting because that was what ha- what would have happened if Tony didn't make it back through the portal after Avengers 1. Yeah. Which, admittedly, I've thought about, you know, once or twice, you know, just in my awake at 2 in the morning and can't get to sleep musings. Mm-hmm. But once you got past that, it was, you know, either make your comparison. It was Mario Kart, Death Race, or Mad Max. Yeah. Like, I, I'm i sorry. I just didn't care. Like, it was cool. And it was it was interesting to see Tony interacting with, with Korg and Valkyrie and everybody else from, you know, that portion of the MCU. But the first four episodes, I, I just d- didn't care. I give five a pass just because that brought back Captain Carter. It brought back her Steve Rogers that went missing. So and it tied in a little bit with, you know, the obvious twist on it to uh, Captain America, too. Mm-hmm. So I, I enjoyed that one a little bit just because it brought back somebody we know, somebody that was established from season two or season one, excuse me, you know, and it tied back into the movie. But like I said, the first four episodes, absolute garbage. But especially two. You had more of an appreciation for it after the season finale. Yeah. No, because let's face it, that's where they start setting up where the portals yeah. show up, and that's yeah. where you know Peggy Carter gets taken to a different place, yeah. and that's where you get the whole was the Avengers formed in uh, 1602, yeah. which if you know Marvel Comics, you know that year is very synonymous. Right. But how they did it here was kind of a nice little twist. I mean, it's a lot different than what you remember from the series as such. Right. So it all leads into arguably the strongest episode of the season. 
Uh-huh. And that's the finale. Yeah. Because that's where you see Doctor Strange, the evil Doctor Strange, who we've yep. known from the entire time uh, that we even saw him in the Multiverse of, ba- of Madness. Yep. Comes back. And this is the one that we it was the big villain of season one. You now see him back here, too. Voice uh-huh. by Benedict Cumberbatch, too, which, like, yep. like I say, it's always great to hear him do the voice work and just tear into it. And this is where he's now trying to connect or recruit Peggy Carter uh-huh. to help him find the universe killers. He's selling her a line of bullshit, and she's buying in. Mm-hmm. So he, she eventually gets sold on it. Yep. And is transported to a world, and that's where she bumps into Kahori. Mm-hmm. And that's where Kahori is telling her, like, no. <laughs> he's he's lying to you. You need to wake up and realize it. Yeah. So she's on to the game that's going on, too, which, I mean, I... And like I say, I missed for where we went from point A to point B from the original run into each other because right. I was like, how did she escape him? Right. So no matter what the case is, you now see Kahori and uh, Agent Carter uh-huh. working together. Yep. And well, Captain well, Carter, I should say. Captain Carter and, and Kahori are working together and Strange shows up. I think he's expecting at this point for like things to be resolved and he can come in and do what he needs to do. Mm-hmm. And that's when he shows up, sees it's kind of taking a left turn at Albuquerque and gone, well, crap, this isn't ideal. Right, because it's revealed that he's trying to... <laughs> he's, he's basically fueling a machine that will rewrite the, his... Uh, it bring back his universe. Yeah. Because his universe is gone because of what he did and, and all the, the toll it took on the physical universe. Yeah, so he's trying to use Kahori's powers to fuel it. Well, to fuel it, and then he's also taking all of the superpowered individuals he's captured and sacrificing their basically life force, whatever yep. it was, and into this like furnace, I think is what I, I think is what they called it. I could be wrong, but basically like feed them into this furnace and then their life force will power back somehow reasons. Yeah. You know, the means to bring back his universe. Doctor Strange is the definition of reasons. Like anything, uh-huh. anything that happens in those books, yeah, it is what pad reasons. reasons. So as you see, they do have a great fight sequence that goes on. Yeah, and you see that Captain Carter winds up freeing everybody that's that's jailed. Yep, by Evil Strange. Yep. So we are seeing just this insane. It looked like a prison break, kinda. But during this encounter, too, it had to be one. I, I kind of laughed, but I was like, this is also cool, too. Mm-hmm. Did you see Killmonger being the Black Panther with the Infinity Stones? Yep. And is about ready to attack. And you have like this this great back and forth banter between Kahori and Captain Carter. Mm-hmm. And Captain Carter's like, I don't know how we're going to stop him. Kahori's like, oh, easy. Boom. Makes him disappear so he gets the armor. Yep. Like, it's fantastic. Like, I love this moment. Everyone who's falling into the forge then starts giving their weapons. Like, I know Mjolnir shows up at one point. Hela uh, throws one of her daggers mm-hmm. at one point. Like, if, if anyone we've seen from, like, the previous however many episodes, like, if they had a weapon, they throw it. Yeah. So this is where you see Kahori can tap into being uh, a teleporter and get mm-hmm. everybody back to their proper timelines, which she does. Yep. And then you see, like, they're about ready to make a breakthrough to Stephen Strange because he's technically possessed by the dark magic that he conjured. Uh huh. And they think it's going to happen, but it doesn't. Yep. And then you just see him emerge as the demon being, yep. too, which was a fantastic thing. So they are fighting. And then when his machine starts crashing on itself, he more or less sacrifices himself to stop it. Uh huh. Because he finally sinks in like he's the reason for it. So you have that little bit of humility to him. Uh-huh. Which he had been sorely lacking, but that's something that that's a typical theme in Doctor Strange. Yes. So the resolution is the happy ending, where the Watcher intervenes. Uh-huh. Who, whenever you see the Watcher, who's voiced by Jeffrey Wright too, we gotta say, always does a fantastic job with him. Yes. Intervenes in any story, no matter if it's print, TV. Mo- I can't wait to see the live action. Yes. You know, it's hit the fan. Uh huh. So to see him show up here. Dude who's not supposed to interfere or interferes. Yeah. So they he winds up sending Kohori back to her planet. Yep. And Captain Carter goes now to Doctor Strange's universe and the the tragic irony uh-huh. that his yeah, his machine worked, but he's not allowed to enjoy it because he no, he does not exist in it. His machine worked, his world is back, his universe is back, the love of his life, Christine, is back, mm. but it's a universe in which he was never born. Right. So they have like this bittersweet happy ending. Yep. 
And then Captain Carter says, well, before I go back, can you show me the multiverse? And he's like, absolutely. I thought you'd never ask. Yeah, which is interesting. Especially for what they show after. Yeah, which, I mean, let's get into that. Yeah, so he goes to show them the multiverse. And for reasons we don't know quite yet, I'm sure they'll get answered in season three. Because, hey, we know season three is coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, They go to a certain portion of the multiverse in time, out of time. I don't know. Hasn't been quite explained yet. We see a certain tree you should be all too familiar with if you've seen season two of Loki. Yep. That would be the tree Loki formed when he held the multiverse together. Mm -hmm. So presumably we're going to see the God of stories, Loki. Yes. So I'm curious if he's going to be the narrator. Could be. For season three. Maybe Jeffrey Wright's busy and can't um, get the time to do season three. Well, I think that would be just an interesting tie in to where they're going now. Ooh, what if they're both doing it, but it's like you, it's like you and your sibling are trying to tell the same story, but you've got different recollections of it? I would it, love that. And they're, and they're arguing over the right telling of the story. That'd be amazing. Oh, that'd be so good. You know what? And that's the one great thing about the series that they can do. Yeah. Because there really is no tie into continuum. However, though, I think if the, the fact they're bringing up the tree, and obviously with recent events in MCU, mm-hmm. we don't know the fate of Kang and where they're going with moving forward as we're recording. We just, we don't know. Correct. But if they're still on this path, they can still go and tie this into Loki. Yeah. Or they can just carve their own uh, path another way. Yeah. And go there. So, I mean, there's so many different moving parts happening here. Yeah, there is. But it's a cool thing to see happen. And like I say, I think, you know, for where for what you get out of what if you get your money's worth. Uh-huh. Because you shouldn't expect the MCU, you'll expect something different. No. Uh, you'll get something fun, you'll get something different. Every episode might not hit for you, but by and large it's enjoyable. Right. I mean, that's the one thing, but you get this from the comic too. Yeah. Because there's a lot of times that creators just the whole point is just to give you a different perspective. Yeah. Like that's the great thing about what if. I will say though, uh, with the final episode, I did love how they took the Marvel intro and what ifed it. Yeah. Where they took all the characters from what if and put it in the Marvel intro. That that was really cool. Yeah. So if anybody wants a quick introduction to the uh multiverse, that's a perfect way to get on board. Yeah. However, we were gift a teaser for season three. I can't help but wonder if this was an episode they were working on for season two, but just ran out of time because strike and whatnot. I think so. Uh, because this is, you know, a two minute and 57 second clip that was posted online by the folks over at Disney and Marvel. That seems real far along mm-hmm. for being season three when we didn't know season three was coming until this clip was posted. Yeah. And in this, we have a pairing of the Red Guardian Uh and Winter Soldier. A younger Red Guardian than we saw in the Black Widow movie. Yeah. It kind of had like like an interesting, you know, supernatural kind of feel to it Mm -hmm. with the car and just a little bit. Um, Because they're trying to cross through a police line. In the middle of a desert someplace. Right. And you see that uh, one Goliath. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, played by Lawrence Fishburne. Yes. Is the agent in charge. Younger than we saw him in, what was it, Ant-Man and the Wasp? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as he's questioning them, they are, they're they not ready for this because you, you see the Red Guardian whose voice, it has to be David Harbour. It, I, it has to be. I mean, they're, they're going to this roadblock or this police stop where they're clearly, they're lo- the, you know, the authorities are looking for someone mm-hmm. because, you know, the Red Guardian and Bucky aren't surprised by this. And Red Guardian says... Oh, don't worry. Let me take care of it. And Goliath sees the car. It's this, you know, 70s American muscle car pulling up. He goes and he sees who's in it. And he's got, we think, you know, just based on his reaction, he can probably figure out who it is. Yeah. And he says, here, I'll take this one. And he goes up to the car and he says, hey, guys, where are you headed? And And if this is David Harbour playing the Guardian in this clip, phenomenal performance because go back and and watch the clip once and then rewatch it again because what happens in the exchange, he struggles to keep the American accent. Yes. It slips in and out, you know, which is phenomenal performance on Harbour, if it is Harbour's part. And if it's not, whoever you are, phenomenal performance. Mm -hmm. But he goes, hey, guys, where are you headed? And they're like, uh, 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 uh. And I think Bucky goes, oh, we're brothers. You know, we're going to see our sister. It's her birthday. And he's like, oh, you're both the brothers, and you got your sister uh, a gift? What did you get her? You know, my sister's just so hard to purchase for. Yeah. And they're like, uh, we got her a TV, and uh, I forget what the other thing they said was. And he's like, wow, you guys really like your sister. And he, at that point, he looks in the backseat of the car, and he sees some stuff that isn't exactly a television. Uh, 
covered up in the backseat mm-hmm. of the car. And he goes, that's great. Why don't you tell me where you're really going? Yeah. And Bucky pulls out his pistol to shoot him in the face. Red Guardian floors it, drives through the police roadblock. Uh, and they're like, hey, why did you do this? Blah, blah, blah. And that's when it cuts to black. Well, after you get a little, you know, chasing with Goliath and somebody else with him. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic way to leave everything hanging. Yeah. But it's a perfect way to end the season because you are starting a new story. Yes. So where that's going to lead to ultimately, who knows. But yeah, we'll see. I mean, Pat, final thoughts on season two of What If? Second half of the season was great. First half, forgettable. You know, just first half didn't hit for me. You mm-hmm. know, but, but once you got to, like, the Captain Carter 2, Captain America 2 episode with, where it was her, it was Captain Carter teaming up with Black Widow, you know, and they find and they find the uh, they find Steve, and and it's kind of like the rehash of uh, Winter Soldier. That was a, that was a great episode, and from there to the end is where it really hit for me. But overall, I I think I like season one better. You give it a grade? Uh, if we're talking out of ten, yeah, probably a six. Okay, you know, I I give season one probably an eight mm-hmm. out of eight out of ten. I give this one like a five and a half six. Okay, no, that's fair. I, no, I have to agree. Like, it started slow, but the one thing is I'm used to reading What If from the comics. So I, w- I understand your point, yeah. and, and that's why I say, like, I get it. For me, I, I took it for what it was. Uh-huh. And that's something that I'm used to reading is just you take a, a, you know, a B or C list character, let sure. him run, and, and sure. do something fun. So I fully think, though, if we're talking the entire season as a whole – I think it never hit the ground running until episode six. Right. And I think that you just had a couple moving parts. If you're going to try to tie it all together, I think they would have been better to have done it right from the get go. Uh huh. They didn't. And I think that yeah. hurt because it kind of felt like we're going to try to tie in this all together at the end, which if you're trying to invest with the multiverse and these different characters. Right. It honestly, it felt like, okay, this is important and this is filler. And I hate saying that, but that's just yeah. kind of how it comes across. Only thing I want to know is we had that Hulk show up in the final episode that was wacky as all fuck. Yeah. I want to know what version of Hulk that was. Yeah. And so does most of the internet. Yeah, I think we're going to find out. I know what, I know. Reddit's been going nuts trying to figure that out. Yeah. We're, we're going to have to deep dive into that uh, at some point. I, and I think Marvel Studios is listening about that. So let's we'll see. Please let us know who he is. Yeah. Do a, do a one-shot comic issue. You know what? That's a beauty that you can do with what if the the playbook is wide open, so it does it, it encourages creativity. Yeah, and that's what you had here. Albeit though, if you're but you're gearing this towards the pop culture audience, and mm-hmm. I think that that's where the disconnect is. You you can really sell the show with season one, saying every episode is a ta- different take on one of the movies you have seen. Yeah, but when it comes to season two. You know, you're going to know the characters, but it's not going to be anything they're familiar with. Mm. You know, it'll be b- bits and elements and pieces you're familiar with, but it's not really until episode five that it's something they can like. Obviously, you and I can sink our teeth into the first five episodes and, and understand them and get them to a certain degree because we're comic fans. We, sure. We've been reading comics for a while. But if you get somebody like, you know, my girlfriend or my fiance, excuse me, Liz, who's not much of a comic reader, she's seen a couple of movies. If I go to show her season two, she's not gonna. She's gonna know some of the faces and, and people in the first four or five, four or five episodes, but it's maybe not until the latter half that she's gonna go. Okay, I'm starting to get this. Yeah. So I mean, for me, I'll give it a grade of a six and a half, seven. Okay. Um, like I say, I think I, I'll definitely say the latter half of the season is a seven. Yeah. If you're saying as a whole, I'll say six point five. It's just. You get stuff that's better than average, but it, you got to take it for what it is, and that's the problem. Uh huh. That I think that depending on what side of the fandom you fall on, you're either going to really enjoy it for the cre- creativity, or you're going to be kind of disappointed because it's like, well, these all don't tie together. This is just what it is. Either way, though, I still recommend watching it and making your own opinions about it, and then hitting us up on that hashtag hashtag #GoToPagePod. What is your thoughts on Marvel Studios animated show What If Season Two? Let's have that discussion, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, guys. It's Alan Dunford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, Pad. 
What you got? Got a few things to talk about. Uh, first, which is obviously being the local minute for sports and looking at the standings for the Federal Prospects Hockey League. That is, of course, the uh, Hockey League, our local Binghamton Black Bears play in and another week. Still in first place in the Empire Division. Let's go. Uh, through 24 games played, they have a record of 16 wins, two losses, and then five losses in either overtime or shootout. Uh, and they've got one shootout win. Uh, they have 55 points. They're ahead of Motor City, who's in second place with 41 points points danbury who's in third place with 33 points watertown in fourth place with 24 points and elmira in last with 19 points uh looking at their schedule from this past week they had a handful they had three games go on this past week uh they had friday december 29th they were on the road playing the elmira river sharks and they won by the final score of seven to three uh came back on saturday against the danbury hat tricks that was on the road lost that one by the final score of five to four and then on new year's eve which was sunday december 31st at home against danbury Hat, the Danbury Hattricks. They lost by the final score of 4-3. to three. Uh, Looking ahead to this upcoming weekend, they got just the one game. And it is a home game on Saturday, January 6th, 7 o'clock Eastern against the Motor City Rockers. Uh, so that'll be local here in the 607. So for more tickets, information, all that good stuff, go to BinghamtonBlackBears.com. And we got to talk a little bit of uh, college football because mm-hmm. we are we are nearing the end of the college football season. Uh, two of the uh college football playoff games have occurred we got one more to go we know who's in the college football playoff game but we got to mention real quickly you had the michigan wolverines pull up arguably to me one of the bigger upsets i've seen in quite some time because i did not think they'd be able to beat the alabama crimson tide but they did by the final score of 27 to 20 uh moving on to the college football playoff and on the flip side you had the uh washington or excuse me yeah the washington huskies defeat the texas longhorns by the final score of 37 to 31 to move on to the college football football final which is taking place this monday uh that would be january 8th 7 30 eastern on espn it's going to be on every espn channel known to man so it's probably abc espn espn2 espn news espn plus it'll be everywhere you know they'll they'll probably have a manning cast on one channel mcafee's crew on another channel the main broadcast on a third channel you know it's going to be on a bunch uh currently look is so the game is in houston texas currently the line is michigan by four and a half and the over under is 55 Five and a half. Hmm. You know what? I'm going to say, and, and to borrow a quote from Thanos, maybe I judged you too harshly. To the Michigan Wolverines, you know, for all the bullshit and shenanigans they pulled during the regular season with the cheating and the sign stealing and everything else, maybe they are legit. Maybe maybe they are that good. You know, the thing about it is... If- I, I thought being a Penn State guy, you know, and, and watching the Penn State... Michigan game, most of it. I was driving for part of it, um, but I I thought to me they were they were a one trick pony. That mm-hmm. if if you figured out what that one trick was, and you shut it down, you're good to go. Yeah, clearly, you know what I I, I might have been wrong on them. No, I think the thing with Michigan is I think they're playing for Harbaugh. And yeah, I, that, yeah, I, that's true. And I think that they want to make a statement and uh, give a big middle finger to the NCAA. Yeah, that's true. I fully think that. So I would take Michigan by seven. It is wild though. Which Washington Huskies from the Pac-12. Pac-12 is after this season no longer a thing. Yeah, but it is wild that at least on some level there's still always there's always until those clocks hit zero, you know, and the final whistle blows, there's always a chance that the Pac-12 could win the national title in their final performance, which is just wild. To it's going to be a great game. Uh huh. I fully think it's going to be a great game. But there's all there's one other game we got to talk about though. Yeah. Uh, this one was the Capital Orange Bowl, which took place a couple of days ago. Uh, looking at, you know, early last week, uh, between the number five Georgia Bulldogs and the number, uh, excuse me, the number six Georgia Bulldogs and the number five Florida State Seminoles. Uh, Georgia won by the final score of 63 to three. Now, I understand that Florida State had 28 or 30 players opt out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I realize some folks are going to say, well, so did Georgia. Well, Georgia's players that opt out weren't starters. And to the Florida State football Seminoles, any gripe or any beef y'all got with the NCAA, while justified and understandable, at this point, you need to shut the hell up. Yep. Because personally, if it were me and I were in the position of the Florida State Seminoles, I would be frustrated. I would be upset. I would be yelling a lot of obscenities at any members of the college football playoff committee if I were to see them in public. Mm -hmm. But also, if it were me, I would want to prove those you-know-what wrong. And I would want to go out there and go up against the two-time 
reigning, defending, undisputed, because they're still the reigning champs and, um, until Monday, you know, when the college football playoff is decided and it's either Washington or it's Michigan, Georgia's still the national champions. Mm-hmm. I would have wanted to go out there and beat the holy hell out of them and gone, hey, that's why we should have been in the COD football playoff. Fully. We're undefeated. We just knocked off the two time defending, you know, undefeated, uh, undisputed, you know, national football, college football champion, you know, but, but instead you had 30 guys quit on you for various reasons. Transfer portal, didn't want to play. Sure, there's multiple. Get, getting ready for the draft. It is what it is, but it's embarrassing. And at the end of the day, yeah, people are going to remember how you got screwed. But I would say that percentage is more college football diehard fans. You know, the casual sports fans aren't going to remember, you know, that you got screwed over. It's that you got your asses handed to you by 60. I feel like I should do the the Obi-Wan, you were the chosen one (laughs) speech. Because we got on here and we defended you. We we were wrong. Yeah, we were. The committee does no wrong. They got it right. Uh, Because you guys didn't show up. You embarrassed us. You embarrassed a lot of people. Yeah, you did. No heart. Um, I'm sorry. Just going to put it out there. I mean, Georgia is a great team and all. Don't get me wrong. But when it's, you, it's hard to go back to back in college football. But the fact that you guys laid down and had no fight. Yep. I'm sorry. Like you guys just surrendered. You gave up 35 points in the second quarter. You only put up three. Yeah. And that was your only points of the entire game. That's the whole thing. Like you guys quit. That's yep. what, that's the thing. You just yeah. you know, like I say, just had nothing. Uh huh. And the fact that. You just just got trounced. Oh yeah, to put it mildly. Oh yeah, it, it proved everything the committee was right about, and it proved that anything that anybody was defending you about was wrong. So mm-hmm. you know, let's say we take that all here, and good win for Georgia and Florida yeah. State. Can't say anything for a year. Nope. It's the same. Uh, one more sports story because I remember this while we were uh, recording, and I want to get your opinion on this. Okay. Uh, in terms of boxing matchups, you think you think of any off the top of your head you'd like to see in the immediate future? Well, I mean, we always got the heavyweights, but, okay. but I mean, other than that, um, I don't want to see uh, Triple G and Canelo again. Okay. How are you feeling about Manny Pacquiao versus Floyd Mayweather, too? Why? <laughs> <laughs> so this is from SI.com. Uh, boxing news. Manny Pacquiao versus Floyd Mayweather fight announced for 2024. F-O-H. <laughs> that, that's my official statement. So the article reads, Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather Jr. are geared up for a boxing rematch in 2024. Manny Pacquiao unveiled the fight plans via Ryzen 45 on December 31st. Uh, quote, next year, I hope to see you here in Japan with a big fight against. Uh, that Pacquiao looked over to Ryzen CEO uh, Nobu- Nobuyuki Sakakabara, uh, Floyd Mayweather, uh, it was announced quote. I thought that you didn't want me to say that Pacquiao chuckled, uh, the article goes on to say, we have yet to see confirmation from Mayweather, but Ryzen has played host to two money fights in the past. Mayweather first fought kickboxing phenom tension Nazukawa at Ryzen 14 in 2018. And then against, uh, Mikuru Asakura at Super Ryzen 1 in 2022. Pacquiao hasn't fought under the Ryzen banner yet. The Filipino boxer announced his signing with the Japanese promotion in 2022, but failed to make any appearances in 2023. Uh, instead of Ryzen Pacquiao, however, Pacquiao will box as part of uh, Thailand's Fresh Air Festival in April 2024 against the Thai boxing legend uh, Bu- Buakwa, B-U-A-K-A-W, uh, Bon Chamek in an exhibition match, close quote. So how you feel on Manny Pacquiao versus Floyd Mayweather 2? No. <laughs> Simply no. I'm sorry. The the fact that the fight happened <laughs> at least five years too late, the original time. It was 2015, I believe. Yeah, when Pacquiao was past the prime. Like, no, yep. I, I have no interest to see this. I The I, fight was bad the first time. You know, oh, almost, almost 10 years terrible. ago. Almost 10 years ago. It's not going to be any better 10 years later. Yeah, exactly. I have no desire to see this. I'd rather watch Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz fight again. Let me put it that way. Ugh. That says it all. God. Uh, quickly for sports, though, Knicks made a big move at the trade uh, yeah. after Christmas. Yeah. OG and Anobi is coming over from Toronto for RJ Barrett and Emmanuel Quickly. Um, I'm okay moving Barrett. I do not like moving quickly, but... It is what it is. I think Anobe helps us out tremendously. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's the the piece that will get us over to the championship. I th- it helps, think, though. Yeah, we're still one away. 
I'm still hoping maybe Carl Anthony Towns for Julius Randle and putting that karma out in the world. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. But uh, it was a good move for the Knicks. Uh, they needed to do something. RJ has been too inconsistent over the years. I And what else can you really say? Just It is what it is. I mean, I'm looking at the stats. 18.3 points a game, 4.4 rebounds a game, 2.4 assists per game, field goal percentage of 42 and a 42 and a half i mean they're okay they're not great yeah they're not stellar no so nothing really right home about there but it's the knicks they're still playing solid basketball yes. that's what i want to see it just yes. i think there's still one more move away yes I'm, I'm still putting the karma out maybe joel Embiid. maybe maybe yeah. just something uh and as for the rangers well i guess what still in first place in the metropolitan division i'll be though carolina's making a run at them yeah and uh the last game though whew, not a good one rangers were defeated six to one by the hurricanes they need to bounce back uh, on Thursday night against the Blackhawks, but still, it's Blue Shirt Nation all day, every day here at the ODPH. And speaking of hockey, we got to give credit, kudos to the NHL for the outdoor game they did the other day. Oh, yeah, against Seattle and Vegas. Seattle and Vegas. Specifically, the player entrances, especially when Seattle was coming coming out, and they had the guys from the market in Seattle where like they tossed the fish across, yeah, yeah. across a room. They were doing that between the players. Yeah. So like they've got one guy on one side, one guy on the other side, and in between players walking, they're tossing the fish back and forth. That was nuts. Yeah, it's insane. Insane game, I'll tell you. All right, so let's get to some entertainment and take the show home. Yeah, so a couple of entertainment stories. First of which is um, he thinks the stories of his retirement were a little premature because John Williams, the legendary composer, has withdrawn his retirement talk. Uh, and he said he'd compose again. So reading from an article on IGN.com, it says, quote, renowned composer John Williams has taken back his retirement statement, stating that he'd be open to composing a movie again if it is interesting to him and if it had a schedule that he could cope with. In an interview with The Times newspaper, Williams wanted to clarify what he said in 2022 about Indiana Jones 5 being his final movie. Quote, I don't care much for grand... uh, Pronunciamados, mentos, statements that are firm and finished and surrounded by closed doors. If I made one without putting it in context, then I withdraw it, close quote. Williams explained that he's open to composing more films as long as they're interesting to him and that, above all, it's important to keep an open mind and not to close doors if you don't have to. Quote, if a film came along that I was greatly interested in with a schedule that I could cope with, then I wouldn't want to rule anything out. Everything is possible. All is before us. Our only limitations are holding us back. Or to put it more simply, I like to keep an open mind. Close quote. So I I am ecstatic about this because, in my opinion, John Williams is the greatest composer of our time. Don't believe me. Go look up his IMDb page and look at the number of movies you recognize the goddamn theme to. Uh, Jaws, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones. Yeah, more power to him if you Memo- want to. Memoirs of a Geisha, I know, is another one he did. You know, if he's more willing to do that, so hi, Steven Spielberg. You've not lost your composer quite yet. Uh, but no, hey, good for him if he thinks he can still do it. He's going to turn like 92 this year. Yeah, I mean, if he can still do it, God bless yeah. him. Yeah, so I'm super, super happy and excited about that. Uh, slightly related, uh, some Star Wars news. Uh, we're not getting any Kylo Ren or Adam Driver stuff anytime soon. Oh. Yeah, so he has confirmed that he is not coming back to Star Wars. Uh, so this is a reading from an article on IGN. It says, quote, the actor who played Kylo Ren in the contentious Star Wars sequel trilogy appeared on the Smartless podcast uh, over the holidays to clear the air about him returning to a gal- the galaxy far, far away amid rumors of him co-starring with Daisy Ridley in the upcoming Jedi Order movie. He told the hosts and fellow actors Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, and Sean Hayes that that's not the case when they asked if there were any talks about him being involved in more Star Wars projects. Quote, they're doing stuff, but not with me. I'm not doing any more, Driver said. He followed up the question, quote, you're done because the character's done with a yes, close quote. So not super surprised by this. I know he's yeah. been he's been very vocal about, you know, the film in the last couple of months. I know he's in, there's some movie he's in that's coming out soon. So he's been doing a press tour and obviously this is making the, you know, this line of questions been making the rounds. But I, I know chiefly among them was the story that came out of, what they originally had planned for the character from uh, Force Awakens to what it ended up being was not the case. That initially they wanted him to go the Vader route but not be redeemed. Mm. And then that obviously powers that B got involved, plans yeah. changed, and things went the way they did. You know, so for 
And, and, and it sounds like he didn't have the greatest time with, you know, the behind the scenes stuff. Cause he seems like a guy who's very entrenched and loves the behind the scenes aspect of filming. So for him to have had what appears to be a negative experience, I'm not surprised he doesn't want to go back to it. Well, I mean, the thing about it is once you, once you have such an iconic role as, as he did. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do after? Like, yeah. you, I, I would say this, if money talks and a good script comes his way, I don't doubt him flipping. Stuff. I'm never going to say never just because, you know, I thought never with Harrison Ford. And then, well, obviously he came back and I thought never with uh, Hayden Christensen just because of the way the fans were. But obviously he came back. About the only never I can think of is Jake Lloyd, who played Anakin in the uh, the, mm. fa- the Phantom Menace. Not going to get into that story. Look it up on your yeah. own time. That's a messy story. Yep. Uh, and then sticking with Star Wars news, an interesting little fan animation came out this last week uh, that I definitely think you should go out and, and check out. Uh, so if you go to YouTube and you search Anakin versus Obi-Wan Clone Wars uh, should be the first thing you see pop up on your page from a YouTube channel called Hello There. Currently sitting at 1.8 million views in in four days. Uh, Somebody took the battle between Anakin and Obi-Wan from Revenge of the Sith at Star Wars Episode 3 and Clone Wars it. Now, admittedly, the animation, little janky. Uh, I'd have, if I had to compare it, it's like season one Clone Wars. It's not as flowing and cohesive as you get in later yeah, seasons. It's, it's clunky. It's clunky, but so is season one of Clone Wars. So, you know, they don't, the fans that made this didn't necessarily have the same tools at their uh, disposal that, you know, the folks at Lucasfilm did. Uh, and, and obviously, you can tell the voice, I think, is AI, which that's a whole other ball of messy wax. I, do, I don't think uh james arnold taylor and i i don't think the actor's name escapes me but the guy who voiced anakin had anything to do with this Mm. but regardless it's a very cool animation now they obviously took some liberties with it because if you watch the film there are poor portions where the fight cuts out and you're going to see what's going on between palpatine and yoda they took liberties with those scenes to what was going on they added some lines but regardless it's a very cool animation it's about uh about f- almost 16 minutes. So you, if you got a you know cool minute while you're on break at work or you know you're sitting in some traffic you can't get through and you're not moving, definitely give it a watch. It's definitely worth a watch. Yeah. It's a very cool video. So definitely if you're just into Star Wars, you want to check it out. Yeah. Uh, then we got to move on to some Marvel news because uh, Marvel's Thunderbolts is reportedly losing Stephen Young. Yeah, I heard about this. Yeah, so according to the Hollywood Reporter, uh, reading from an article over uh, by those folks, it says, quote, Stephen Yun will not be suiting up for Thunderbolts, the anti-hero centric feature in the works from Marvel Studios, sources tell the Hollywood Reporter. Yun's involvement in Thunderbolts was first reported back in February. Excuse me, though Marvel never officially announced the casting. Five months earlier, during a D23 presentation, the studio revealed Florence Pugh, Sebastian Stan, David Harbour, Wyatt Russell, and Julia Louise Dreyfus were among the Marvel mainstays who would be in the film. Like many tentpoles, Thunderbolts was struck by last year's dual writers and actor strikes, which put schedules in disarray across Hollywood. Thunderbolts was initially slated for July 2024, but was pushed back a year to July 2025 and has yet to begin filming. Jake Schreier is directing Thunderbolts, which is rumored to assemble a team of Marvel's anti-heroes and villains. Yun already leads a high-profile comic book poetry property, excuse me, as the voice star of In- Invincible, Amazon's adaptation of the Robert Kirkman comic. Mm-hmm. He rose to prominence uh, as one of the leads of The Walking Dead and is in the awards season race for his Netflix limited series Beef. He will compete for the Golden Globes for Best Male Actor in a limited series on Sunday later this month, will be in contention at the Emmys for a limited actor in a limited series as an executive producer of beef. He also shares an Emmy nomination in outstanding or limited series category coming up this year. He has a role in bong Jun Ho's uh, Mickey 17 and Sundance the feature. Love me starring Kristen Stewart. Close quote. So busy dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what's also being reported. I know deadlines. One of the ones that reported it. Uh, it sounds like it was scheduling conflicts. There was no sort of, disagreement between him and marvel it's just he's busy and is contractually obligated to something else well i think that's the big problem coming out of the strike yeah is you're you're going to hear more of this happening yep and it's very interesting to hear i did i mean obviously hearing he was playing the century yeah i was very curious to see how this is going to play out albeit though if they're copying what's going on in the new series Mm -hmm. i i think that would be interesting if you haven't checked out that series by jason lou right it's a really interesting idea. I'm not going to lie, because obviously, if you know me well, 
you know where I stand on the century. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting concept. Yeah. So I, if they were going to do that in the com or for the movie, I think that would have been really cool. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's an unfortunate shame that you can't do it. But you know, like I say, when it's Hollywood, stuff like this happens. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, and lastly, certainly not leastly, one more bit of uh, entertainment news. I wanted to do this kind of as a PSA because you might have missed this news. I know I saw it in my email, but if you are an Amazon Prime uh, video subscriber, you might have missed this in an email or it might have gone to a folder you don't check that frequently. Uh, and that is starting on January 29th, Amazon Prime video will start showing ads. Uh, so reading, really? Yeah. So reading from an article on TheVerge.com, it says, quote, earlier this year, Amazon announced plans to start incorporating ads into movies and TV shows streamed from its prime video service. And now the company has revealed a specific date when you'll start seeing them. It's January 29th. Quote, this will allow us to continue investing in compelling content and keep increasing that investment over a long period of time. Close quote. The company said in an email to customers about the pending shift to limit advertisements uh, quote we aim to have meaningfully fewer ads than linear TV and other streaming TV providers no action is required from you and there is no change to the current price of your prime membership the company wrote customers have the option to, of paying an additional two dollars and 99 cents per month to keep avoiding advertisements the rest of the email summarizes the many benefits of a prime subscription no doubt an attempt to keep customers from canceling this over this decision uh, Verge readers were none too pleased about the initial news back in September. Uh, Amazon Prime currently costs $14.99 each month or $139 annually. Uh, Prime Video can be subscribed to individually for $8.99 a month. The new charge for ad-free streaming would bring Prime to just under $18 and would push standalone Prime Video to just $12 a month. Close quote. Interesting. Yeah. But I mean, this is the way the streaming is going. Like, yeah. it's so funny for it not being cable; it's turning into cable. It's turning into cable, and I, I figured I'd bring that to people's attention. I know I uh, caught it, but I figure with the way it's, you know some email uh, subscription and the email services work, some of you might have missed out on that. Personally, I'm not going to give them the extra two ninety nine. I don't use it all that much. Yeah, I know some people do because you know they've got their Paramount Plus subscription through them. They've got their Max subscription through them. They've got you know a Crunchyroll subscription through them, like whatever. So like they use Prime Video for a lot. I don't use it for all that much. Like it's not really. I'm not watching a ton of shows on Prime right now. So it, like if I got to deal with ads, I got to deal with ads. Like. I you know I watch some of their original stuff consistently, although not super consistently. Like I'm bouncing around between different stuff. So hey, if you do it, more power to you. Me personally, yeah, no. I'm with you on that. Yep. So let's get to the comic shops. Uh, obviously, new comic book day starts first. The, the one of the 2024. So Pat, what yeah. you picking up this week? Couple things. Uh, first, the which is from the folks at DC, and this is Neil Before Zod issue number one, uh, written by Joe Casey. And this one reads: "Quote General Zod was Krypton's most notorious criminal." Now he has an entire planet to rule. But what happens when the most dangerous individual in the universe gets everything he ever wanted? Obviously, he wants to get he wants more and he'll stop at nothing to get it in the most brutal series you'll read this year. This is not a hero's journey. This is a dark ride brought to you by the sick and twisted minds of Adventures of Superman writer Joe Casey and artist Dan McDade in his monumental mainline DC debut for General Zod and his family. The descent into hell has just begun. Uh, and the cover looks, that looks good. Looks nuts. Yeah. It, you, you, uh, next to Zot's face, you see the bloodbath starts here. And I'm not going to lie, uh, the planet he's holding, a little familiar. Yeah, I was going to say, it looks like Earth. Yeah, it looks like Earth. Uh, it is cracking at the seams, so to speak. Uh, so, well, yeah, this will be something to see. It's going to be nuts. Yeah, I can't wait to pick this up. Then from the folks over at Marvel, you've got Amazing Spider-Man issue number 41. Uh, this obviously is a continuation of the Gang War story written by Zeb Wells. This says, Gang War continues with all of New York's super underworld fighting for dominance. You, you didn't think Wilson Fisk, the former kingpin of crime, would sit this out, did you? Of course not. So that's going to be something definitely interesting to say. Gang War has been very, very good for Spider-Man. Yeah. So I'm going to say, like, if you've if you've been turned off in the past because mm-hmm. of, because of other stories, uh-huh. this is a good one to get back into. I, I've really liked what I've read thus far. Then from the folks at Marvel, we got Venom issue number 29 from Al Ewing. Uh, this one reads: Eddie Brock's tour de force continues while chaos is reigned for Dylan Brock and the Venom symbiote. Eddie Brock continues to kick ass and take no prisoners, fighting like hell to get back 
back to them. Eddie started as a king in black and has gone on a transformative journey that has put Meredith's very existence into a state of uncertainty. But with Meredith's fate thrown into question, so is Eddie's and his transform transformations aren't over. Uh, I'm showing you the cover there. What does that look like? Oh, that? Uh-huh. That, that kind of looks like the the Peter Parker Spider-Man outfit. Yeah. Yeah, and then you get on the bottom, which is kind of inverse, which that's that that looks like Hella. Yeah, that's a really weird looking cover. Uh-huh. That looks nuts. Okay, you got my attention. It'll be nuts. Can't wait to read it. Uh, and then for the fine folks at Star Wars, you've got Star Wars Darth Vader issue number 42 from Greg Pak. Uh, this is on the cover says Rise of the Schism Imperial. Uh, this one reads, quote, the rise of the Schism Imperial. In the wake of dark droids, Darth Vader explores his powers and takes on the most dangerous team of rebel heroes he's ever faced. Meanwhile, the greatest threat to the Emperor's rule is rising from within the Empire itself. Will the Dark Lord of the Sith uh, destroy it? or join it featuring the comic book debut of Enric pride from the star Wars, from star Wars, the rise of Skywalker. Uh, so this one definitely interesting because I recognize two of these faces, uh, on the cover. Well, three, obviously Darth Vader's there. Cause Hey, it's his own comic. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then two of the folks behind him, uh, immediately behind Darth Vader is, uh, Masa Beta, who was like one of Palpatine's right hand dudes in the, uh, prequels survived survived into the uh original trilogy never saw him but he's mentioned in a couple books uh and then the other one on the side i forget the character's name but if you ever watch the prequels that was the other character that was like in the blue and had like the all white skin that was also oh oh uh, yeah i i forget the character's name but like that's the other one who this other one is some imperial officer i don't know who that is but this is gonna be nuts it's, yeah, it's star wars it's darth vader greg pox writing you can't go wrong no you definitely can't no one else you can't go wrong with Star Wars and Charles Soule, uh, because he has one out this week. Star Wars, The High Republic, Shadows of Starlight, issue number four. Uh, Martian Rowe wins. The final glimpse of the lost year of the High Republic is revealed as we fall as we follow the eye of the storm himself. Martian Rowe, from his greatest triumph, the destruction of the Jedi Fortress, known as Starlight Beacon, to the many trials that came after. Like I've said before, uh, Star Wars, The High Republic, phenomenal storytelling. You cannot go wrong with that. No. Lastly, certainly not leastly, from the folks over at Dynamite Comics, Gargoyles issue number 11 from Greg Weissman. Uh, with the Manhattan clan back together again, Brooklyn and Katana ask Broadway, Lexington, and Angela to stand as their seconds during the all-important commitment ceremony. The clan has never felt stronger, which is a good thing, because a desperate uh, Dino Draken is about to make one last play to take over all of New York City. So I mean, the commitment ceremony sounds like a little bit of a wedding. A little bit. Well, uh, you see the you see the cover. Uh, a little bit of love struck eyes holding hands there. We know how comics and uh, marriage and comics usually go. But, usually um, doesn't go well. It's like the, pro wrestling the, weddings. The ceremonies typically don't go well. So we'll see what kind of antics ensue with this. Yeah. Interesting uh, book there, though. Like I said, yeah. the gargoyles. Like I've heard nothing but good things, and definitely heard more about live action mm -hmm. involving them. So can't wait. Yeah, for me this week, uh, DC side of things, Bird of Pre Birds of Prey is out. So definitely that story has been great. Kelly Thompson on the book. You can't go wrong there. Uh, also, Batman one forty one. Oh, oh my. boy. The end of Mind Bomb is here, and what an insane story! Chip Zdarsky and Jorge Menez have going on. Uh, I will admit, like, uh, the backup personality of Zenner uh -huh. has not been my favorite, but how they pulled this off, this this is just nothing but just insanity happening here, and the ending is definitely going to surprise some people here. Uh, the review is up right now on Parlay Points, so definitely make sure you go check that out. Over from the fine folks at Marvel, uh, the end is here, Pat. Okay. Fall of the House of X, number uh, one. Okay. So okay. the book ends to the original start of the Krakoan era are now gar are now starting to come out. So this one definitely has a lot of moving parts involved. Nice. And uh, definitely excited to see where this story is going. So mm -hmm. it's a good introduction issue, and definitely am very, very intrigued about this. Also coming out this week, man, there's so much good stuff happening at the, at the shops too. Uh, IDW, Hunger in the Dusk. If you haven't picked up this series, it, this is one of the best books out. More people need to be talking about. So if you're in like this, you know, fantasy aspect, this is going to be right up your alley. IDW is putting on some great, great stuff. And last but not least, Boom Studios has a book out that, uh, listen, I'm already killed the lead. I gave it a 10 out of 10. Oh, wow. Pine and Merrimack okay. by Kyle Starks and Fran Galen. So this is a story about a married couple who's private investigators, mm -hmm. and they now are caught up in a in a mystery uh, missing persons case. Okay, 
the elements involved here really are something it's very familiar but very different at the same time Mm -hmm. and i love how the setup is here i love the first issue the the dialogue i think starks did such an amazing job galan knocked it out of the park too uh with the artwork and just like where they're going with this i love a good murder mystery and this is something like right up my alley and i love like the modern take on it as well too so if you're looking to check out something pine and merrimack i've got that uh is by boom studios i definitely give a high high recommendation about that this week and if you're looking for more comic reviews nerdinitiative.com has you covered every wednesday starting at 9 a.m and even on tuesdays now uh with certain publishers so definitely mm. make sure to go check that out or parlay points we always have those reviews for you as well because pad where does everybody go odphpodcast.com for anything and everything that is the odph you find it right then and there and as we always like to say Go out and support your favorite local comic shops wherever you are at, and make sure if you're looking for more recommendations. Also, got to plug the Cheersy Awards happened on YouTube. Amazing show last night. Shout out to the whole Nerd Initiative team about that one. Making a lot of waves, getting a lot of positive feedback. Saw a, a few creators sharing the show today on social, so it's always cool to see. That's it for this week. So for the one only Pat One J, New Year, fuck the Astros. I'm your host Ken M. Thank you as always for listening to the OD Page Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time. Such waste of time Swiping left and swiping right On people you could know Cause anyone who's worth a damn Be worth way more than a picture could ever show You can find the right light Find the right angle And never find your soul And it can feel like a losing battle And this plot is full of holes This modern way of finding love Just makes me feel so alone And I can't be the only one Sick of staring at my phone So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me time fables everyone has just one true love all i know is you're across this table and you're all i'm thinking of so look up talk to me a better way to spend our energy just look up talk to me Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know